This is a homily for the Feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 to 6, and chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 8, and verses 11 and 12, and verses 17 to 19. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. In today's Gospel, Luke stresses that Mary and Joseph, as devout and pious Jews, were faithful to all the requirements of the Mosaic Law. Luke tells us of three ancient ceremonies that Joseph and Mary observed following the birth of Jesus. Firstly, the circumcision and naming of the child. Secondly, purification following childbirth. And finally, the presentation of the child. In chapter 2, verse 21, that's immediately before the beginning of today's gospel, we're told that Jesus was circumcised and named. Luke is reminding his readers that Jesus was a Jew. Circumcision was so sacred a ritual that the ceremony could be carried out even on the Sabbath, and that was a day on which the Jewish law forbade almost every act that wasn't absolutely essential. After a boy was circumcised, he then bore forever the sign that he was one of God's chosen people. It was on the day of his circumcision that a boy formally received his name. The child is named Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew. That is the name that he'd been called by the angel before his conception. Our English pronunciation of the name is Jesus. That comes to us through the Greek, the language of the New Testament. The name in Greek is Jesus. The name in Hebrew is Yeshua. It was a common Jewish name, and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures made about 200 BC, the name Jesus occurs over 270 times. The longer form of the name is Yehoshua, which is translated as Joshua in English Bibles. The shorter form of the name is Yeshua. For an ancient Hebrew speaker, these were really just two variations of the same name. Yehoshua, or Joshua as we pronounce it in English, is the longer form of the name. The shorter and later form of the name is Yeshua. It would seem that by the first century AD, the shorter form of the name, Yeshua, prevailed. So I think it would be safe to say that the Hebrew name underlying the Greek Jesus in the New Testament is the shorter form of the Hebrew name, and that is Yeshua. The original meaning of Yehoshua was Yahweh helps, from the root to help. However, a popular etymology connected the name and its shortened form with the root to save and the noun salvation. So the name is the key to this child's identity. This child is the saving presence of God among us. We come to the second ceremony. Today's Gospel begins with Luke telling us that when the day came for them to be purified, as laid down by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus up to Jerusalem. Although Luke seems to suggest that both parents needed to be purified, it was only the mother who needed to be purified. A woman who bore a male child was considered unclean for 40 days. The distance between Bethlehem and Jerusalem is about 8 kilometres. At this point, we need to make an important point about purification. 
it has nothing to do with sin. The mother is not being purified because she has sinned in any way, nor is there any suggestion that the process of childbirth is in some way sinful. The purification that the mother undergoes expresses a very moving and profound truth. To understand what purification is all about, we need to keep in mind that Judaism drew a sharp line of demarcation between the profane and the sacred. The etymology of the word profane is interesting. It means literally outside the temple. Farnum is the Latin word for temple. The temple is a sacred space. The profane is any space beyond the temple. When Jewish priests offered sacrifice, they had first to be purified and they had to wear special vestments. Nothing secular could enter into the presence of God. Giving birth is a creative act. The mother participates in God's act of creation. When she gives birth, she enters the sacred. She becomes one with the Creator. So before returning to secular life, the mother marked the end of her contact with the divine through the ritual of purification. The mother had to make an offering of a year-old lamb and a turtle dove or a pigeon. If she was poor, she made the offering of a pair of turtle doves. So the parents of Jesus are portrayed as being among the poor of the land. Thirdly, there is the presentation of the child. Mary and Joseph took Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This was known as the redemption of the firstborn. In the book of Exodus, the Lord tells Moses, Consecrate all the firstborn to me, the firstborn from every womb among the Israelites, whether human or animal, it is mine. The firstborn child belonged to God, and the parents had therefore to buy the child back from the Lord. Although Luke omits details of the payment, it was an amount of five sanctuary shekels. Five sanctuary shekels was equal to twenty denarii. One denarius is the daily wage for a labourer. So 20 denarii is the equivalent of a labourer's wage for 20 days. This ancient ceremony reminds us that, in the words of Father Ronald Roldheiser, the children we have are not really ours. They are given to us in trust for a time, a short time really, and we are asked to be mothers and fathers, mentors, guardians, protectors, teachers, and friends to them. But they are never really our children. If we understand this, we will be less inclined to act as owners, to manipulate our children for our own needs, to see them as satellites within our own orbits. Although our children are not really ours, we do have a profound influence upon them. This photograph, published in the Sydney Morning Herald a few years ago, illustrates what I mean. The photograph was taken by the young girl's father, who had strapped a camera to his chest as he swirled his daughter around. But look closely at the young girl's eyes they reflect the image of her father. And therein lies a profound truth. As parents, we leave our image upon the lives of our children. It is our task to educate our children. But education is not really about filling their minds with everything we think they need to know. Etymologically, the word education comes from the Latin educare, which means to lead out. 
In other words, education is a process of helping someone else to discover the gifts, the abilities, the talents that are already theirs, and to help bring them to birth, to bring them forth. Let me illustrate what I mean. Death Valley is a national park in California. It is the lowest, driest and hottest area in North America. It's called Death Valley because it is so dry that almost nothing grows there. It almost never rains. If you go to Google Images and type in Death Valley, California, you will find many photographs of an incredibly beautiful landscape, but a landscape dry and barren. Virtually nothing can grow there. It seems lifeless, harsh and dry. Not a blade of grass to be seen, not a bush, shrub or tree in sight. This is more like a lunar landscape, or perhaps Mars totally alien to life. It almost never rains there. But in the winter of 2004, there was a torrential downpour. More than eight inches of rain fell in a very short time. And what a transformation that downpour had. Death Valley was totally transformed. Google Death Valley Spring 2005, and you will see photographs of Death Valley carpeted by a spectacular array of wild flowers. The barren desert landscape has been transformed. So Death Valley wasn't dead, but dormant. The seeds of all those wild flowers were waiting beneath the desert sands for the transformative power of the rain. And therein lies a parable. Within all of us are seeds of possibility, waiting for the right conditions to come about before they can sprout into life. A perfect metaphor for education at its very best. Let's now turn to the two elderly Israelites whom we meet in this story, Simeon and Anna. Luke presents them as faithful Israelites who hang upon the ancient promises God has made to Israel. Through prayer and fasting, they are best equipped to recognize the promised salvation when it eventually comes. Simeon, who was promised that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, is able to discern in this very ordinary family from the poorer class the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. Simeon's great prayer is known to us today by its Latin title, the Nunc Dimittis. Since the 5th century, this canticle has been recited every day at Compline or night prayer. At last, O powerful master, you give leave to your servant to go in peace according to your promise. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all nations, the light to enlighten the Gentiles and give glory to Israel, your people. Luke is making an important point here. This child is to be, first of all, a light to enlighten the Gentiles, and only secondly, to give glory to Israel, God's people. So here in Luke's infancy narrative is a reminder that the gospel, the good news, is not only for the people of Israel, it is good news for all nations. And Christian tradition has given Simeon the title Theodokos, a Greek word which means receiver of God. On this Feast of the Holy Family, let us all pray that we also may be a Theodokos, a receiver of God. Alongside the prophet Simeon, there now appears the prophetess Anna. 
an 84-year-old woman whose husband had died after seven years of marriage. Given that girls at that time were given in marriage at the age of 12 or 13, we may assume that Anna had been widowed for well over 60 years. She had not become bitter at her misfortune, but rather she is the model of the truly devout person. The supreme moment in her life, the hour of Jesus' appearance in the temple, comes towards the very end of her life. She has waited patiently a long time for this moment. That brings us to the story told in today's first reading from the book of Genesis and referred to in our second reading from the letter to the Hebrews. We first meet Abraham and his family in chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. They live in their native land, Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham's father, Terah, decides to move to the land of Canaan and sets out with Abraham, Abraham's wife, Sarah, and Terah's grandson, Lot. However, when they arrive at Haran, the family settles there. We're also told in chapter 11 that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren. In Haran, God calls Abraham, Go forth from your land and your birthplace and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and those who damn you I will curse, and all the clans of the earth through you shall be blessed. Abraham is 75 years old. Just think about God's call for a moment. God promises a 75-year-old man whose wife is barren, that he will make him a great nation. That brings us to today's first reading from chapter 15. Abraham points out to God that he is childless. He has no descendants. His heir will not therefore be his own son, but some man of his household. However, God assures him that his heir shall be of his own flesh and blood. God then takes Abraham outside and says, Look up to the heavens and count the stars if you can count them. So shall be your seed. Abraham puts his faith in God's promise, but that promise is not fulfilled immediately despite the impression given by today's first reading. The final verses of today's first reading skip over five chapters, taking us from chapter 15 to chapter 21. Sarah gives birth to Isaac when Abraham is 100 years old. So, between God first calling Abraham and the birth of Isaac, there is a gap of 25 years. God's promise to make Abraham into a great nation didn't happen immediately. There were 25 years of waiting. There are important lessons here for us about discipleship. Firstly, God's call and its fulfillment often demands patient waiting. And we in the 21st century are not good at waiting. Father Timothy Radcliffe makes this point using the example of a plane crash in Canada in 2004. The pilots were carrying fresh vegetables from Africa to Western markets and had been flying for almost 24 hours. They were overcome by fatigue. Father Radcliffe writes, Consumers expect to find asparagus and snap peas in their supermarkets all year round. They do not wish to wait until the due season. 
They want them now. The pilots fly for dangerously long hours. This is the fourth crash of a plane of this company since 1992. The founder of the company said that it is not the fault of the supermarkets. They are merely responding to market demands which tolerate no waiting. We do indeed live in a society that tolerates no waiting. But God's timetable cannot be manipulated to satisfy our schedule. So, lesson one, God's call and its fulfilment often demands patient waiting. Secondly, God's call and its fulfilment does not have a statute of limitation or a use-by date. For some of us, the supreme call will come later in life, as it did for Abraham and Sarah and for Simeon and Anna. In 1958, Angelo Roncalli was elected Pope at the age of 78 and took the name John XXIII. It is difficult to know for certain what the College of Cardinals had in mind, but some commentators have suggested that Roncalli was elected to be a mere caretaker pope. John XXIII was anything but a caretaker pope. By summoning the Second Vatican Council, he inaugurated a great era of renewal within the Church. Roncalli had kept a journal for most of his adult life, and it has been published under the title Journal of a Soul. One entry in his journal was written during a retreat he made during Holy Week of 1945. He was then aged 64. The journal entry reads, I must not disguise from myself the truth. I am definitely approaching old age. My mind resents this and almost rebels, for I still feel so young, eager, agile and alert. But one look in the mirror disillusions me. It was to be another 13 years before Angelo Roncalli was elected Pope at the age of 78. As Pope John XXIII, he instigated a monumental period of renewal in the Church. And let us also remember Pope Benedict XVI, who was elected to the papacy at the age of 78, several years beyond the mandatory retirement age for bishops. And Pope Francis was elected Pope at the age of 76. Like Simeon and Anna, Popes John, Benedict and Francis were called to do great things for God well beyond the traditional age of retirement. And that is a powerful reminder to all of us that God's call has no use-by date, no statute of limitations.